bringing it back was horrific. When I was dropped in it at the start, I thought, no bother. It, he just simply said to me, you're bringing this locomotive from Plymouth to Coat Bridge. I thought, fine. And then, then it started. Um, <laughs> the trauma of bringing the Garrett back is one that will live with me, which actually took up about, I think, four months of, of last year, a year of I mean, it's the last locomotive I will ever buy in my life, <laughs> basically. Um, totally fraught with problems from beginning to end. I was asked by the committee members, or curator Mark O'Neill and the committee members, to go down in May to see this local before we finally bought it. And uh, when I went down to Plymouth uh, and saw this local, I thought it was fantastic. It was in marvellous order. Uh, considering it was built in 1956, uh, I had a camera with me from the museum, took many photographs inside and out. When we went into the footplates, all gauges, everything was in that locomotive intact, even to the, the whistle horn, the whistle on the cord for the whistle was still intact, and I was amazed. Right, well I think the first one we're going to have, we've also got to have this uh, water tank taken off the shaft here, this is where the original boat goes, so yeah. obviously these bolts and secure the tank to the main chassis there, they'll all have to come out and be undone. Yeah, and are you a lubrication pipe work as well, I suppose? That's right, all of the, uh, the pipe work in there, and the, uh, the main steam pipe, and the, uh, the various connections between the two sections, certainly they'll uh, all have okay. to come apart there. Well, I think some of that's been apart before. Yes, yes, it's, uh, well hopefully it shouldn't be too difficult to uh, take apart. Um, it's fairly high running in terms of the pipe work, obviously we've got to drop the centre section of the loco between our road modules to get it down low enough, but I think we may have to uh, look at possibly taking some of the bottom ash, ga um, ash pan gear away. What, just, just that hopper door? Just that, uh, yeah, yeah, that, that sliding uh, yeah. door section etc. Um, that might, we might be able to get around that. We've got some calculations to do just on the uh, on the heights and that at this stage. And of course, we've got the same sort of problem at this end, haven't we? Yeah, uh, that's right. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. So most of that. Most of it is connected by that. That's right. Yeah. I, yeah. A, lo a lot of it was put back together when they came here. Yes. Arrived. Yes. Yeah, so uh, a good few hours work there, and uh, I'm doing all of that, basically. No, nothing else particularly sort of getting in the way or sticking out or whatever? I don't think so. No, it all seems to be uh, fairly straightforward. So there's a couple of days work there. A couple of days, you know. A couple of days, get it ready, yeah. yeah. I left school, uh, at the start of the war the schools were closed and uh, were taken into various houses after about a month getting nowhere. So uh, I decided to look for a job and the nearest place to me was Hyde Park or NB Local. And uh, I went in there and started in the time office, counting house or whatever you like to call it. And uh, they did all the wages for the, the works and it would be about nine months there before I transferred to the plant drawing office, which um, was over in the new other building over in Flemington Street. And um, from there, we worked, did the service, the, all the three works, well I was only an apprentice certainly, but uh, we worked with the draftsman and picked up all the ideas and whatever. I uh, went from there eventually about 15 months time to do my shop experience. Uh, and then I went into the Hyde Park Works. Um, they called this place the Klondike, but it was no Klondike. <laughs> it was pretty cold, uh, coming from the office straight in there. But this was the marking off of the main frames and the other parts of the local. Excellent. No, no, we never had, never dropped one. Many a time I've been down in the lower hole, 40 feet down, watching this 92 ton local coming down with a sling around the front end, the smoke box, and think if that sling breaks, where will we end up, you know? It gave you a thought. 
but we never had any problems really as far as I we've had the wee odd thing which sort of you had to look in what you did in the drawing office you worked out the centre of gravity you superimposed the beam by drawing on the, the local everything by calculation looked right but the, the practical side was the final. You went down to the dock side. If the dockers, the, the, the lofty beam we had had a series of holes along the bottom and to bring the beam into the centre of the local or to the centre of gravity, you moved the third hole at the front, the last hole at the back, and that kept the slings clear of the local eh, for damage. But if the docker, I gave him a drawing down there, but if something happened, a docker who had the biggest shout eh, decided, oh, it should be the other way around, then the local got a dip and once they lifted it partly off the bogey, they couldn't land it properly because of the it tended to damage cylinders or pipes or something. So it was always a tense moment as the lift was taken. You've kept watching all the wheels in the local to see that slicing high at the front. How long was it going to go? You were able to stop it at it a certain height because you thought it was coming dangerous. The dockers wouldn't. They just knew they had to attach it together, lift it, and that was it. But. Uh, Funnily enough, we never had any real problems, no accidents, nobody was killed, nobody was injured, other than a man getting his fingers jammed, but that happens anywhere. of the making, the, the style of the factory, their machinery and so forth, it was going to cost an awful money to replace the older types of the machinery, plus the fact I don't think they could adapt really, I don't know whether it was they didn't want to adapt, I think they always held on to the hope that steam would still be in the market.
Oh yes, you probably, I think it's about 5,000 or something like that between the works. You had the Hyde Park works on this side and across the railway you had Atlas works. So you had a, a big workforce. Uh, in fact, when the, the horn blew, the whole of the street outside was chalked with people running to get transport home. Tram, there's tram cars in these days and buses, tram cars and buses, or bicycles, or feet. Well, we, we were chosen to, do, to make a picture of the draftsman's drawings. The, dra the draftsman drew roughly in pencil on paper, and when we traced through a tracing cloth, we placed tracing cloth on top of their drawing, and we made a picture of it. You were trained in what thicknesses of lines you had to uh, trace. Like so, the centre line was very fine, a chain dotted line, and your uh, di dimension lines were fine, with an arrow head at each end, pointing to sizes. And then your outline had to be slightly heavier. Everybody said we were too long getting into diesels. Uh, the financial side of the company didn't bother us on the technical side. We started in the morning, finished at night, and we had our paid our salary and we were quite happy, or you weren't quite happy whichever way you went. But um, the diesels, we started building diesels in '46 with a diesel miner, and we also got about, oh, I think, a dozen uh, German experts on diesel, and they worked in the drawing office to uh, give us an idea of how we could build diesels. And um, so we built the first diesel in 46, and then we progressed with building other ones, and then we changed to building the diesel engine, the man diesel engine. Now, whether that was a good idea or not, I don't know. We had to redo the whole factory over in Atlas to accommodate these, um, building these, lo these uh, engines. So we were building diesels for quite a long time. But NB to me was a steam company. They began steam way back in about 1844 with the Nielsen people and it was steam the whole way through right to touching on 60, 1960. And all our steam directors and managers were all getting old and the new ones were coming in and they weren't concerned with steam. So we were still to get more orders to build diesels and it was a new idea of work for us, different, different types of work. You couldn't have a boiler man building uh, an engine without training.
that box to stay and have a look inside, Eileen. If I can get this one out Oh, surely. <laughs> It's pretty of an automatic stoker. Mm -hmm. In other words, you open the controls and the screw drives the coal in from the tender into your fire. But this is your fire door here, when you can open and have a look to see where the fire is. Yes, these two doors shut and you can see whether well, the fire's uh, in good condition or it's got to be spread around the firebox inside. It's a very big area inside. To, uh, this is why they've got a mechanical stoker, 63 and a half square feet of area great area inside there. In America, I understand uh, they won't allow uh, people to fire a local under uh, over 50 square feet. So this is why they've got this mechanical unit here. And uh, they have, in some areas where they had three stoke, three firemen at one time, two firing and one bringing down. Did you use one of this size? Right. If you didn't have the mechanical, so right. was this invented specially or developed specially for this? It, well, they got brought in uh, by the designers. Mm -hmm. uh, to the uh, uh, fireless boiler. And that would be in sort of 1950s then? Oh, it's the 1950s, yes, right? Yes, it is. Uh, I remember these saying these stoke of, yep, there's this new blow here, actually, it's parked right in here. Mm -hmm. And this takes it right down here. What confuses me, especially about this, is how in the air did the driver drive it? Oh, he did. Look at this seat. Well, it's this in this seat. Yes. And he looks out right from the front here. It's such a long thing. It's yeah, that's right. Well, a captain of a ship, he's up in the bridge and he's in in front of him at the same time. Mm -hmm. I always imagined they had a window at the front. No, we've only got to... So, would you be in here in sole charge of all yes. this? Yes, yes, you would be in charge of all the whole working of the boiler. You know whether the steam was high enough, you have steam gauges here carrying on what the pressure is. 200 pounds per square inch on this locomotive. And uh, it also has a vacuum system for the brakes, you know, whether the, the vacuum is all right for braking and such like. But these would all be indicated in these two All the gauges, gauges in the front here, he's got all the gauges. And you can sit on either side of his loco to see right ahead. But if you sit in the seat to look forward, you can see quite a distance. Okay. You can see well well, you're just thinking of it's built for very tight curves as it is because it's only a three foot yeah, six that's speed. right. Yeah, it should be quite a lot behind you and in front of you, you know. That's right. right. Yes, yes. I mean, have a look at the thing. I must. I'm feeling almost maternal about it. Actually, almost warning people away. Don't touch my garret. It's here. Counterbalanced. You can see there. Then you can on to the main frame of the local, which would be built. Uh, it's all been limited together here. The main part of the frame was cast in America, which is a one casting. And so it would be actually shipped over to Springburn? Uh, the frame would be shipped, yes. The frame shipped to Springburn. And the lot put up together. The pipe part for all the machining work to be done on it. And now coming down to the cab, here we are at 4112, which was the number of this particular locomotive. Why did they have different numbers? That, that means each well, the contract, the contract, how they uh, numbered the contract, then it was mapped accordingly. So we can right now to our boiler, which is seven feet diameter boiler. And um, that is freshly baked on. Yes, it's quite a big boiler uh, for a type of local. The idea of the garret is you can get a bigger boiler in on the space because of the of the local. Mm -hmm. Okay, then we can right down, this is all of the ash comes, five boxes in at the back there and all the ash comes down here. Well it just falls out and it falls out, well we can take it to a pit, you know, if you're taking it out the five boxes and take it to a pit. So it would store not only coal and water? But the ash is all the ashes as well. No, the ash is being once it's wooden money, you see, so they've got to clean out the ash by and after. Right, yeah. that's it. This is at the end, this part's coming down, yeah. uh, open up the, the bottom part of the ash falls into the, the pit. Okay. Okay. So we've come reversible up and it's uh, this way, 282 plus 284, we're now coming to the opposite end, which is the same as the first end. <laughs> Why? <laughs> <laughs> well, I just would have asked for the, the one with two sides. Two and it, well, you know, not that I know much about them, but I know that there were 
feel too generous because yeah. of the well, particular the situation it was built for. I mean, that's the extra water because they travel long distances in South Africa where they're trying to pick up water. So this is the water tank at the front end now. And a mountainous sort of country as well. Yes, that's right. So the water in the back and the water in the front. We've got roughly 9,000 gallons of carry and 14 tons of coal. Eventually it will come to spring, but that was always the ultimate um, aim of the thing. Uh, Cookridge has very kindly agreed to look after it. What we'll be doing is bringing teams of maintenance x ray women from Springburn out to work in the garrets, um, give it a coat of paint, which you can see it needs, um, fix up the rust on. Ultimately, it, the dream is to have it back in Springburn where it was made, so it can be enjoyed by, by local Springburn people. Well, at the moment, Irene, we are standing in what was part of the finishing shop, which came right up in the corner, right past the building here. Then, in this area, there would be about you know, 50 to 100 men working in the finishing shop. We uh, move forward uh, to part of the boiler shop, which was on the other side of the finishing shop. And uh, all this area here, a number of men who worked about the boiler shop, right across to the other side where the built boilers and riveted them, rolled the plates and uh, riveted them all together to form the, the locomotive boiler. Uh, now this was the boundary wall of the NB local, right down here. There was an area of uh, small sheds where people like uh, Cement sheds and glazier sheds and all the rest of it. So would there be sort of like railway lines? Not here. Along, not, no. not here. They may have been on the rail on the finishing side where they did all the connecting roads. Uh, and they may have some lines, but not normally. Not all the lines were on the other right, side. So it, this was a concrete floors. Concrete floors. Uh, on here, as you'll see, there's certain grassy bits. Uh -huh. Well, these would be where machines were sitting. And they filled it up with earth, you know, once they made the site there. So, so this is a foundation to... for a machine. You'll see quite a few here. Uh -huh. Right across here, you had machinery uh, looking, uh, doing all the sort of component parts of the locomotive, building the boilers in here. But right on here, on this side, you can down here, right on to the machine shops, heavy machine shops. Mm -hmm. If you look across here, this was our main office building which was uh, a mark from the time of amalgamation, 1903. This was the main building, opened by Lord Rosebery a uh, few years later. Uh, it's now the Glasgow North College, as you know. But that was the headquarters of... That was the headquarters of N.D. Loper, which took in Hyde Park, Atlas and Queen's Park. And that was up directly opposite the works. Further down there, we had the erecting shop, we had the heavy machine shop, we had uh, the frame shop, axle box shop, uh, the tender shop, and then the electric shop, and the yard, the further out small yard where they could test the locomotives. So they're further away down the wall, this side of the railway line. Of course, on the other side was yet another that, locomotive. On the other side here was Atlas Works, across the lane, across the line, main lines there. That was Atlas Works. So they did all the flanging. And during the, the war, you had the shells and um, uh, mines and things like that. Okay. So, was it a direct line from the works onto the main railway line? No. Well, uh, well you mean for taking locals out? Yes. Yes, yes. Well, locals were uh, foreign export, which meant they were different gauge and they had to go by road. But, yeah. But if we've opened for British Rail, then they went out the gate down at the bottom here, onto the main line. Mm -hmm. Atlas had another exit and entrance on their side. But they only wrote in my time electric locusts and a few, a couple of diesel or something like that. So how many men were employed here, say? That is. Oh, 5,000. 5,000? Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
uh, only latterly in the like, 60 they started moving the diesels. Mm -hmm. But uh, it was all steam men in these days. And so can you still see traces? Apart yeah, well, I can see, yes. You, I can, you, you can, can actually tell myself what's... on the, the shop floor. If you could, this was the shop floor, really. And I can locate myself in various points and say, oh, I remember the machines in here. I can't tell you what machines are where. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, you can actually see where all the machines have been sighted. What about, where did the boy look at? Because I'll, I've seen photographs of them There's one, there's one I saw somewhere, I think it's over like here somewhere. Uh, it's been pulled up. But they would lower the boilers oh, yes, so and the people would work underneath. Uh, yes, they would open the sections and then as they put the first section they had to drop it down into the pit and take the next section and then the next one down until they got the height. Because the machine was only a certain height so they had to work right. down below. So there's big, big holes about here. There's big holes all filled up. Uh, as you'll see, they've filled up with dirt and they've grown grass now. Mm -hmm. Once the place was uh, demolished I had to fill the holes up in case someone fell down. <laughs> but it, it has been an epic journey, but yes, absolutely worth it now. Yes, I might take it home for my garden. <laughs> Where are the Bulgari, the low road, the pond, the boundary bar, Quinn's, now all of them gone? Where are the shops, all lit up at night, with windows to look in? And the shutters in sight. So where is my Springburn? Not much left at all. In the midst of my memories, a big shopping mall. For the old homes were bludgeoned till they fell apart, and the streets disappeared, stabbed a pain in my heart. Now there are new things all happening around, new faces, new places, new children abound. They will all have their memories one day, it's true, but they never can recall the Springburn I knew.